This is It Takes Two with Amy and JJ on the Mighty 790 and 104.7 KFGO. This is It Takes Two. Eric Johnson sitting in JJ Gordon's chair today and on the phone lines with us. Mr. Andrew Oak, the first lady's man himself. People have been asking where he's been. It's been too long, apparently, since we've had you on the radio. They're asking for you, Andrew. So we can we can literally say back by popular demand. Yes, <laughs> back by popular demand. <laughs> Um, I don't think I've ever been able to say that before. I love that. Oh, uh, you can say it here in Fargo. You just come see us anytime. Okay, so we've already got questions rolling in for you in the text club, and I know we have some stuff that we, we, we briefly bounced back and forth yesterday that we wanted to talk about. But first question into our text club is so interesting. I have to throw it out there to you. It says, First ladies, man, is it true Mrs. Eisenhower almost ended the cranberry industry? Is that true? <laughs> Um, that's, uh, well, you've stumped the first lady. That's, <laughs> yes! that's the first, that's first question out of the gate. First question out of the gate. Now, I, I mean, I, I know a lot about Mamie Eisenhower and a lot of the things that she did. I have not heard my Mamie. There's a lot of stories out there about Mamie. One of the, one of the more famous ones is about her famous fudge and it, it relates to cooking and things like that, but there were no cranberries in the fudge. So I don't know that she would have created some great shortage. But I know that a lot of people still make her fudge. And Mimi's mother told her when she was young, if you know how to cook, people will ask you to cook. So if you don't like to cook, don't learn how to cook. Basically, don't learn how to do something that you don't like doing. Mimi didn't like to cook, so she knew how to make two things. She knew how to make mayonnaise, and she knew how to make fudge. And she enjoyed making fudge. So, And people don't really ask for homemade mayonnaise too often, I would imagine. <laughs> I'm going to have to look into the cranberry. Yeah. Now, one of the things that she did was fantastic was she, um, she, she made, um, uh, uh, she opened the White House Easter egg roll to all races and citizens for civil liberties and stuff, which was fantastic to include African American and minorities on the, uh, on the White House lawn for the Easter egg roll. So she really did a lot of, of really good things and, and the, uh, 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 some of the other stuff that, that followed along after that. Um, so, so I'm going to look into the cranberry thing. Yeah, look into the cranberry thing. I, it's just I, so I found, I, here, but I, I found a New Yorker story that that addresses it. So apparently, on November 26th of 1959, Mamie Eisenhower served applesauce with dinner, and a, an actor at the time, Rosalind Russell, leaked the menu to national media, and that. Uh, got spun into a headline that said no cranberries for president and got you. Uh, I, I think that this had ripple fantastic. effects into the industry <laughs> thank, no thank you for bringing that up so so people will remember in in more recent history when george w h w bush bush 41 said if i don't want broccoli i don't have to eat broccoli i'm the president of the united states and i never liked broccoli and i don't want broccoli served and people had a fit you know and they're like well, what is he saying that broccoli farmers should go out of bed enough? I mean, these people, and, and this kind of this goes with what we were texting about yesterday yeah. and talking about the public, what the public perceives, and what the public turns these stories into, and what the public goes crazy with over these first families, and 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 more specifically in in my area of study, these first ladies, and it will if you know, a menu like that can make or break a a food, a product, an industry. Uh, Dolly Madison was famous for a cherry, um, two different kinds of ice cream, cherry ice cream, which I've had. They serve it at a place here near me, actually, in Maryland. They still serve Dolly Madison's cherry flavored ice cream. But she also was famous for for serving oyster ice cream. Now, I was raised on the Chesapeake Bay, and I love any kind of oyster. In fact, at an oyster roast, I challenged my father, and I ate 86 oysters in one (laughs) sitting. I didn't feel terribly well afterwards, and I had to lay on the couch for a while while they swam around in my belly, but but they were tasty and delicious. But I cannot imagine eating oyster ice cream. Um, But it was all the rage, and what these women wear, how they style their hair, even more recently than that. There were a lot of female friends of mine that I noticed were wearing a purplish-gray, more gray than purple, nail polish. Amy, you might have worn it yourself. And I would ask people, why did you choose that color? Oh, I don't know. I just saw it on the shelf or I saw it at the salon and thought it was it. Michelle Obama was wearing it. 
And Michelle Obama was the first person to wear it that I know of in the big public eye. Maybe she picked it up off of Vogue magazine or saw some star or someone on TV or someone in her private circles with that. But she was wearing it and people saw it. And subconsciously, women were getting it because they saw it. They didn't even know. Most of the women that I asked who I saw with that color still to this day, I'd say, why did you pick that color? That's a bit of an unusual color. Oh, I have no idea. You know, it just, and maybe some of them did honestly just see it in the rack of the other colors and pick it, you know, inadvertently or just because of people. But these women, these first ladies have massive influence over the public. And that, that, that Mamie Eisenhower story in the Cranberries is a, is a perfect example. Someone said, can you give some insight into Mary Lincoln and all that she endured as the first lady. I don't think she deserved the criticism that's been heaped on her for nearly 150 years. That's a great comment, and that person will very much enjoy the Mary Lincoln chapter in Volume 1 of Unusual for Their Time. Which is Andrew the Oak's reason- book. Okay, you, yes, guys, you yes. guys have to get them. Okay, anyway, keep going. The, the, reason, the reason being that she's absolutely right. Um, that, now, why, why Mary gets a little more grief than most is that Mary went into politics headstrong, eyes wide open. She was raised in Lexington, Kentucky with a politically active father uh, with some of the political superstars of the day coming over to dinner. Mary was given privileges of going into the gentleman's parlor after dinner where whiskey was drank and cigars were smoked. And normally, it wouldn't be caught dead. But her father uh, was one of her closest uh, 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 life influences and, and people in her life. Her, her mother did die when she was young, and she had a stepmother, and she had uh, grandmothers and other things like that. But she and her father were very, very close. So Mary was privy to a lot of these um, conversations and a lot of these uh, after-dinner discussions for political issues and, and things of the time in the day. So she was after someone who she would see in the White House. She said very famously in a letter or to a friend or it was documented somehow that that Mary Lincoln said, Abraham Lincoln isn't the best looking guy in town, but he's going to be president someday. She wanted to go to the White House. She was a huge asset to him when he was running for uh, any political office, uh, when he was small time and before he was a big name. But when you're in the public eye, of course, anything happens. It, it goes to the public. And so all of the, the, the tragedy, now Mary, uh, you know, is a, is, is a bit of an extreme story. And her husband basically died in her lap, you know, when he got shot at Ford Theater. Um, these are extremely difficult and hard situations uh, for any time and any person. Um, you know, back then, death was a little more not accepted or expected, but it, it happened. It was more prevalent. People died. You could die from dehydration. There wasn't blood transfusions. The, the, the medical advances that we've had, you could, you could get shot in the streets, a civil war, every other thing. And, and Mary was a little bit off. Um, there's, there's no doubt. But modern medical research shows that something as easy as maybe vitamin B12 or some other very simple medicines or, or practices, or even having a support group to talk to would have helped her hugely. So she reacted, as anyone would back in the day, with self-medication. I mean, cocaine you could buy over the, the, the counter at a drugstore, and self-medication was, was very easy to do and not always the right thing. So when Mary was institutionalized, which her, her son got a lot of grief for, but he was really saving her life. I, he, he did. She was, she was doing things that were very, very self-detrimental, self, very, very harmful, and could have cost her her life. And her, 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 her son, rather, um, Robert, got her institutionalized in, in Illinois. And all that did for her basically was, was clean her up a little bit as far as with the substances and the self-medicating and things like that. And when she was released, she was much more stable, maybe more stable than she'd been in her entire life and was able to do a lot of traveling and, and live a, a, a later part of her life fairly happy. Uh, you know, again, all things given the given of all of her loss. Um, but, but new documentation when I did the C-SPAN series and then wrote the books came out about that institutionalization and how harmful she was being to herself and how Robert, instead of being criticized and thinking that he was locking his mother up to take all the family money and, and she was an embarrassment and all this, it really wasn't. He, he, was, he was trying to save her life, and he, and he did. Um, and, and then, like I say, that second half of Mary's life was a little more happy than some of the things that, that, that get you know, overpopularized and, and 
and romanticized almost to a point in, in film and Hollywood and pop culture. So Mary does need another look, an, another chance, and, and, and another uh, uh, deep dive into, into research to see what her situation really was. Andrew Oak is the first ladies man. You can find him online, firstladiesman.com. That's where you can also buy volume one and two and learn about all the first ladies yourself. But we're going to keep them here for a little bit longer. If you have any questions, keep them coming at 35270. You can also call us at 237-5948. This is It Takes Two with Amy and JJ. Eric Johnson sitting in for JJ Gordon today on the Mighty 790. And this is It Takes Two, Amy Eiler, J.J. Gordon, Eric Johnson sitting in J.J.'s spot today. And on the phone lines, we have Mr. Andrew Oak. He is the first ladies man. You can find him, his books, everything about the first ladies at First ladiesman.com yeah and andrew uh, our, our chat about mary todd lincoln before the break got me thinking i'm wondering if first ladies often become scapegoats in the press because the press doesn't want to attack presidents directly eric that's a great perspective um and, and sometimes yes um you know first ladies it, you have to go back pretty far in history to to a time when when ladies were exempt from that and it just wasn't gentlemanly you know there, there there were there were some there were some benefits to the dark ages i guess where they were like you know i think women got treated a little bit better in the public eye where it's like oh you don't discuss a, a lady's private life or you don't discuss or you don't bad mouth her it's just bad taste and things like that of course they couldn't vote or own land or have bank accounts or educations so there's more th- uh, bad parts than good parts but there was a, a modicum of, of respect but still things came out in the public and that's part of why FDR, the longest sitting president. I mean, there were there were a lot of things going on in that in that administration. Number one, he took him to a wheelchair that a lot of people didn't know, and um, and and uh, there there were obvious uh, you know physical restrictions to that. But when he put Eleanor Roosevelt out, who couldn't get out of the house fast enough because he had long since uh, uh, revealed an affair and their, their marriage while they stayed together uh, became loveless, and and then they went their own personal separate ways with relationships and things like that. But part of what she did as first lady was she was his leg. She would go and she would she would research things and be the boots on the ground that you would normally see a president do when travel was restricted because of his physical handicap. Then she would come back and report to him and he had a, he had his own scapegoat. He'd go, "Well, I didn't see it myself." You know, if something went bad, he could then say, "Well, that was the information I was given and interpreted from my wife." Um, and I think even more so now, more so now uh, in the past two administrations, so we're talking about Obama and Trump, if people don't like the president or the first lady's husband, then they don't like her. If you go back to the Bush administration, Bush 43, even when there were very strong opinions for and against George W. Bush, everyone, for the most part, of course, loved Laura and still does. And her poll numbers were exceptional. And these women always poll higher than their husbands because that's just the nature of things. And they're not elected and they're not paid. And so there is still part of that 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 reflects in the public opinion. But social media and the internet and the development of information on social media and the internet has changed. And now we can take people's opinions and people's views as fact. Or we can hide behind a computer screen from our home and put out things that we that are opinions and not fact. And that's why people said horrible things about Mrs. Obama that were just completely not true. Or when she wanted to put a garden in the in the in the White House and 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 keep kids healthy and fit and and childhood obesity and other things, she got grief for that. And you think how could she get grief for that? And the same thing happened to Melania Trump. You know, people had very strong opinions, similar to Bush forty three. But but but, um, you know, for or against Obama. And I mean, that's the way the the political climate has gotten worse and worse with each election, in my opinion. And then you see this rise in social media. And now people can use these first ladies more as scapegoats because they're 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 not as off limits as they were before. And people are taking opinion as fact. And it's 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 really unfortunate. It's a sad state of affairs when when we're talking about these first ladies because they're not elected. They're not paid. And they're putting philanthropies and other people ahead of themselves to awareness and other programs to help people that in need and less fortunate, and they're getting criticized for it. Is is there carryover from administration to administration in some of the opinions on first ladies, even though they may be from different political parties? Wow, that's another great question. You know, 
I think that there is, or you know, in the current administration, this is this is very interesting because Jill Biden was the second lady, and she worked with a lot of things with Mrs. Obama um, uh, very closely. They were they were buds. They they did a lot of stuff with with troops and kids and 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 public events and things like that. So you know, if if you didn't like Michelle Obama, chances are you probably didn't like. Jill Biden, and now that she's the first lady, you're not going to cut her a break, and she's getting grief for keeping her day job or using her doctor title or other things where I think just people are nitpicking at this point, you know? I mean, you know, I'm not saying that people's opinions and their thoughts aren't, aren't valid. They, they, they are, but, you know, when, when, you're, when you're coming down to, like, whether she uses Dr. Jill Biden, I mean, I'm not a doctor. I didn't go to school that long. I didn't earn it, and, and my friends that did are pretty happy about that and, and use that title in instances. And when I was in college, some of my professors were doctor. I remember Dr. Kanjar was my um, uh, uh, psych 101 or sociology, sociology 101. Sociology 101 was Dr. Kanjar. And she was fantastic. And we addressed her as Dr. Kanjar. But, you know, point being that, 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 you know, some of the stuff does. But also, I mean, if you if you love, I mean, look at Nancy Reagan into Barbara Bush. I mean, the, you know, that, that was that was an almost seamless uh, transfer into, and, and, and people, people, well, more, more people, Barbara Bush got less criticism than Nancy Reagan. That's, that's for darn sure. But definitely the people that like one kind of carry over into another. Um, and if programs are, are, are continued by first ladies, or at least kept in the same vein or theme, um, you know, if people liked what one first lady did, then, then they like, uh, what another first lady does in 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 concert in tandem but 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 also there's there's hypocrisy you know because you think about this a lot of first ladies are in for veterans children and things like that and if you support one first lady for uh you know speaking up for underprivileged children or education or reading or third world countries or or veterans and then you you chastise another first lady for it well where's the sense in that you know they're just trying to do good with their position and the role that they've been given, again, which is unelected and unpaid. And and getting criticism for serving applesauce instead of cranberries. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. For whatever reason, yesterday I was just thinking about it. It's October. It's Breast Cancer Action Month, as we like to call it on It Takes Two, because we're aware that it exists. What are we doing to... Um, what are we doing now about it? Was there a first lady who sort of kicked started breast cancer awareness in her position? What one hundred percent? And and this is this is a fantastic story uh, and and a great question, Amy. I I have said publicly, so it's out there that the most influential first lady, past, present, or future, is Betty Ford. And people say, how can you predict into the future? How can you say there will never be a more influential first lady? Well, you know, everything uh, from different perspectives can be explained. And Betty Ford championed breast cancer, or we can even generalize that to cancer or cancer with women and addiction. There is no human being that I have found on planet Earth who is not directly or indirectly affected by cancer and or addiction. There's both in my family, and, and most people there's both, because we're human. But I, a woman, when I was saying this at one speech, a, a woman came up to me afterwards, and she said she remembered being a young girl at the kitchen table, and the national news came on and said the first lady, Betty Ford, has breast cancer. She said her father nearly spit his drink out at the table, not believe the word breast was said on TV, during the dinner hour on news. It wasn't talked about. It was hidden. One of the one of the Adamses, one of John and Abigail Adams's daughters had breast cancer in the eighteen hundreds. We did not invent cancer. We did not invent addiction. But no one talked about it. And Betty Ford came out and talked about both. And after her, Nancy Reagan went through breast cancer very publicly. By then, it was it was you know slightly more acceptable, but but there there would be no pink ribbon, there would be no 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 uh, uh, breast cancer walks or this type of awareness to lead to your proactive slogan of breast cancer action, which I love, without Betty Ford, and for her to go through that as the first lady, 
knowing the 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 visibility of her platform and also knowing the flack she would get. Betty Ford was really, really, really her own woman. I mean, she stood out there after the uh, White House in a 60-minute interview with, with Gerald Ford, President Ford, and Mrs. Ford. He said, he goes, most times I sided with my wife anyway, but even if I didn't, it wouldn't matter. She would She would tell people what she thought and think what she said. Uh, and she just... You have to respect that, especially in a time, you know, when we still haven't figured a lot of this stuff out, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. That's goosebumpy to think about. Uh, it really is. Andrew Oak is the First Ladies Man. You can find him at firstladiesman.com. You can find his books there, Volume 1, Volume 2. You can even get a T-shirt to rep him, too. But you stay with us. We've just got a few more minutes in this hour. Get your questions in at 35270. This is It Takes Two. Okay, I'm not sure how an hour goes by this quickly with Andrew Oak, but it went by in a flash. So I've said your website, Last Thoughts, um, your volumes one and two. Let's talk about that for just a minute before we let you go here, Mr. Andrew Oak, the First Ladies Man. Um, they can get you, them on your website. I have picked up a couple of copies. Everybody loves them. They are fun. They aren't daunting reads. You can sort of read about a first lady and move on when you're ready. And you can also go back and watch <laughs> right after I got the books, I texted Andrew and I was like, I need to know where to watch all of the, the series that you did because you did a series for C-SPAN, which you reference in the book a lot. And I was like, I have to be able to watch it. He's like, yeah, go to my website, Amy, First Ladies Man. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Okay. I'll right on that. the video page. I make it easy for you. No, it's a great series, and, and I can only take credit for the work that I did, but the, the whole idea, everything was C SPAN and the White House Historical Association, wonderful organizations, both incredible people there. And um, it was their idea, and I was in the right place at the right time to be the traveling producer for the series. It went to all the locations, so my books are just a travel log of what I learned. Volume 1 is Martha Washington through Ida McKinley, the 1700s and 1800s. Volume 2 is Edith Roosevelt, right up through Melania Trump, the election of Trump in 2016, when we knew she would be our next first lady, and some of my thoughts and opinions there. There's also a really, really interesting, in my humble opinion, or as humble as I can be, uh, an interesting part of the Hillary Clinton chapter that goes over what if, what if Hillary had won and Bill Clinton, President Clinton, had been our first first gentleman and what that might look like in the future if the first gentleman is a former politician, a former president, or if he's not. So there's some really interesting things there for folks. And it's a travel log. Uh, some of my experiences putting together and producing a television show, where the best place to eat in town, where I stay. It's a fun little journey. And then that's all these. These are kind of like backup to everything that I learned and did that made air. And if you go to firstladiesman.com, go to the video page, there's a link right at the top to the C-SPAN series. Watch it in order, out of order. Watch your favorites or back and forth. Follow along with the book, you know, which, whichever way you want to do it. There's there's no wrong way. And, and, and it's just it's been a fantastic experience for me. I'm forever grateful to C-SPAN and the White House Historical Association for the opportunity to become the first ladies man. You're the best. Andrew Oak, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it, and we can't wait to have you back. Take care. We'll talk soon. Deal.